you guys, while I was away, did two weeks out of three on uh, Jesus and people who have a lot, and particularly who have a lot of money. And the reason we decided to do that is for two reasons, to talk about money in church is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's just, I mean, it goes without saying, doesn't it? Bondi is a place where there is a lot of money. And uh, chances are that you are someone who has a lot of money. Actually, last week, I know that Matt Graham spoke about how just by existing in the 21st century and living where we do, um, anywhere in Australia, really, you belong to the top 1% of rich, wealthy people in history. Uh, but Bondi is particularly wealthy, isn't it? And so it's important that as we bring all of our lives under Jesus, that we who have been, for the most part, not all of us maybe, but for the most part, we've been blessed with some wealth, uh, that we think about this in our discipleship. But not just because we're in Bondi. Secondly, we decided to do this because Jesus talks about money all the time. He's that guy who talks about money all the time. I wonder if you've got a friend who talks about money all the time. Maybe they're always telling you about the, the latest podcast on Bitcoin that they've been listening to and they, they want to explain it to you and, and tell you all about it. Or maybe they're talking about how to get a really good deal and how to let's split the bill after dinner and we'll do it this way. Maybe they're just always focused on money. Have you got a friend like that who's just money's always the topic, right, in one way or the other um, uh, or some scheme that they're part of? Jesus is not like that. That's not why he talks about money all the time. The reason Jesus talks about money so much as he speaks, he uses in his illustrations um, and, and just not even as illustrations, sometimes just straight up, is because Jesus knows, well, it's because Jesus wants to know about hearts. And Jesus knows that money is kind of like an x ray of the heart. He says in Matthew's gospel, Matthew quotes him where Jesus says, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says the money's like an x-ray. If you want to know what looks like on the inside, just look for the treasure and then you'll find where the heart is too. He, uh, yeah, and it's, it's quite, it makes you kind of vulnerable as you suddenly go, hmm, I wonder what my, yeah, that's interesting where I spend, where I put my wealth, uh, there's my treasure. And, and Jesus says, okay, there's your heart as well. And uh, so for the reasons, uh, both those reasons, that we live in a place where we just have a lot of wealth for the most part uh, and uh, Jesus knows that it, it opens up your heart pretty quickly um, as you think about what you spend your money on. Uh, well, uh, now, if you're a visitor and you haven't been coming for very long or maybe it's your first night, maybe you're not a Christian person and you're just checking us out, I'm really glad that you're here, but I'm sorry you've picked the week that we're going to talk about money. And I'm going to say, give your money to Jesus. That's, uh, um, you could probably, let's just finish it there. That's where I'm going to land. Um, and any, what I'm trying to say is, I'm, I'm sorry that this is the week for you. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting and you'll learn about us and you'll learn about Jesus. But this talk um, uh, probably isn't right for you. This is for people who uh, know 100% that they're following Jesus. And it might not make complete sense to you if, if that's not you. But that's okay. I'm glad you're here. And you know, I'm sure you'll pick some stuff up along with this. But I'm really talking to people who are 100% straightforward. I, I follow you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, there you go. Well, uh, I once have heard of a church who was stuck on their budget and actually got worse and worse through the year and they just kept on dipping below what was supposed to be happening. And they, were, they started to think, which staff member are we going to have to finish up? And uh, which ministries will we have to, instead of putting people on like we, we are with Sarah, you know, which ones are we going to have to close down? But then it was all right because the minister worked it out and he came out the front and uh, he said on the Sunday morning everybody it's okay god has provided all the money that we need for our budget it, it, the only problem is it's stuck in your pockets at the moment <laughs> <laughs> i think actually that's an urban myth um i've heard that story a few different ways of just an urban myth um uh, but i can tell you a story that's true uh, because my friend john told me about it uh, he's about 70 now and he tells me that growing up in the 60s he went to this church and we have a money box at the door but the way they did giving in their church was you have a bag it didn't get passed along, but instead the warden, so James, Peter in our um, um, situation, uh, the warden would have the bag for giving on the end of a stick. And uh, he, he could go like this along the pews, right? If you're really skilled, you could probably do too. But he'd go along the pews. And if you took too long to get your wallet out, he'd give you a tap. But uh, this one time, John had decided which coin he was going to give. Coins, you remember what, remember what they are? They're these little metal notes. Um, we still remember coins. Um, John remembered which coin. It was 60s. It was the 60s. And so still a uh, coin was worth something. And he knew as a boy which one he was going to give. But he opened up his wallet and they all fell out, all the coins. And the warden 
quick as a whip, jumped on the ground, grabbed them all, put them in the bag before, uh, before John could do anything about it. And, and uh, his money was in the pot now. Uh, and tonight in the story uh, that we see of uh, in, in Acts chapter 16, we'll come to in just a moment, uh, it's different to that. Church giving is different to those two stories. Not because it doesn't imply that God has given you money in your pocket for his uses, but because of the heart of the thing and because of the tone of the thing. It's a completely different tone to having the warden grab your money or the minister tell you they're staying in your pockets. Uh, it's completely different, and you'll see. It's very beautiful. If you've read or seen The Hobbit, uh, do you remember that scene at the start of the story where Bilbo Baggins uh, doesn't know that Gandalf the wizard has put a, a mark on his door so that all these dwarves are coming for dinner, and but Bilbo doesn't know it yet. And so the first one turns up and asks for a, a cup of tea, and then the cup of tea comes out and says, you got some biscuits too? And, the biscuits, and have you got any steaks to go with the biscuits? And suddenly there's this table of food. But then there's 12 dwarves, I think it is, um, and, and Gandalf. And, and they're getting into his good wine and they're eating the best um, cheeses that he's got. And, he, and he's pulling his hair out because he didn't want to give, he's forced to do hospitality. Kind of like John, John's coins being put in the pot without his asking. And it's a completely different tone than what you see in the New Testament. Uh, and so I want you to hear the heart of the thing that God does in this story particularly and see if he doesn't do something to your heart as well. We're in the book of Acts. And you will have noticed in, as, as Rachel read, that Jesus is not actually there because he doesn't get mentioned uh, as a person who's part of this story. Uh, but we're talking about Jesus and people have a lot. So does this one fit in the series? Well, it does. Because the book of Acts is very special in what, in what it's doing. It's a very special point in, in history where um, in Acts chapter 1 at the start of the book, Jesus is standing there, fleshy and touchable. And he says to his followers, just a few of them at that point, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. At that point, they're just a small group in Jerusalem. He says, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the, of the earth. And I'm going to empower you with my spirit. And that's what you see through the book of Acts. There's these lines like, and the word of the Lord increased and, and grew steadily. Things like this just keep on being said. People keep on coming to Jesus and, the, and just grows and grows as Jesus is, is not just kind of witness in concept. Let me tell you some ideas about God and spirituality. No, no. Jesus makes himself present in the book of Acts through his people. And that's what you see in Acts chapter 16. Jesus makes himself present. As, as people witness, his people witness to him. So chapter 16, verse 13 says this. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. This is Paul. He's got Luke with him, who, who's the author of the book. Um, and you'll notice in verse 10, it's just changed from they language to we language because Luke has been picked up. Uh, and Paul and Luke, uh, it sounds like they're having a, just a nice Saturday morning. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. So the riverside stroll. Uh, we expect to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. Just sounds like a nice Saturday morning, um, chatting away with the people that they met there. But there's more going on here than just chatting. This is just a chat. It started that way. But we're about to see that Jesus is going to do something to his people through this chat. He's going to be witnessed to. He's going to empower and something powerful is going to happen. But first, before we hear the powerful thing, uh, we meet Lydia in verse 14, one of the women who was sitting there chatting with Paul and Luke. <clears throat> verse 14. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira called, uh, named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God, it says. This character, uh, this person in the story, has always been just delighting for Christian people and intriguing. It's often people's favourite character in the New Testament. Uh, and there is also, there's so much that is intriguing and delightful about her uh, as, we, as we learn about her. First of all, this Lydia is not from Macedonia. They're in Philippi of Macedonia at the moment. Uh, but it tells us that she's from Thyatira, which is uh, back over to the east and the south a little, uh, over where now they Istanbul in Turkey is. Uh, so she's this foreign lady who's living in Macedonia. Secondly, she's brought one of the traditional uh, products of her area in Turkey uh, um, there to Macedonia, uh, purple cloth. She's a dealer of purple cloth. Um, they're <laughs> beautifully. The two ladies at our morning church that remind me of Lydia 
Penny Coombs, if you might know her, and also Thelma, who's a 100 year old beautiful lady. They both wore purple. They always wore colorful clothes. And so I thought of them a lot this week. They both talked about Lydia. But both of them wore purple this morning, not, not knowing. Uh, well, uh, I reckon Lydia was probably someone that dazzled and delighted people with colorful clothes, either hers or, or, other, or the ones that she traded. Uh, and thirdly, she doesn't just have this interesting job, a dealer of purple cloth. She's almost certainly rich. It's just, it's just a, one of those professions that it's unlikely that you're slumming it if you're a dealer of purple cloth. Uh, that means that you provide beautiful clothes. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you how they make it. Crushed up mollusk shells from, from Turkey. Um, and then and, you, know, you get the purple out of it and then you dye your clothes in it. This is her mm. thing. And uh, you're almost certainly rich because it's, it's the rich that buy these things and uh, money goes around. It's kind of like, you know, an Audi dealer. You're probably unlikely to find an Audi dealer that is not doing reasonably well. And in the same way, Lydia is probably quite wealthy. And it's confirmed for us in just a few lines because what you find is that Lydia uh, has a whole household that she's in charge of. She's not kind of just uh, cooking her own meal. She's got a household that she's in charge of. Uh, the next thing that's kind of interesting about Lydia is she's an independent woman. In those days, sadly, uh, you, as a woman, you'd often be referred to as so-and-so's husband or so-and-so's um, um, wife, but not Lydia. She's, she's just Lydia. It's lovely. Uh, for whatever reason, she's on her own and uh, got her own business, her own household that she looks after. And as I say, she's intriguing, isn't she? And, and, and uh, there in verse 14, we hear about Lydia. She's one of the ladies speaking. But then we hear what God does, what Jesus, the Lord Jesus, does through this just simple conversation. The Lord opened her heart to Paul's message. What does Paul lean towards when he chats with people by the river on Saturday morning? What, is he, what, is, what does he want to do? He wants to share his message, which if you're looking through Acts, it's very clear. Jesus is Lord and Saviour. And that's what he shares with Lydia because look in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart up to respond to Paul's message. And mark this, what a Christian is. It's not, so, and if, if you're a Christian, make sure you know that this is what you are. It's not someone who's interested in community. It's not someone who really loves the morals of the Bible, even though those things are beautiful and great. It's someone who has had the Lord Jesus come and make his home in their heart had their heart unlocked to his truth and his light. If you're a Christian person, you'll know, it might not feel like up ups all the time, but you'll know that God has opened your heart. It's a beautiful, powerful moment that happened to Lydia here. And it says that she and the members of her household were baptized. Uh, Jesus said, go and baptize people and, and uh, make disciples to all nations. And off Jesus' people have gone. Uh, Jerusalem and then now they're all the way out to Macedonia and it's going to keep going out now but here they're already doing what Jesus says baptizing people and it's a beautiful picture baptism of going under the water and dying with Jesus Romans chapter 6 says that don't you know that in your baptism you've died with Jesus you've gone under I got to share this with two different Hoppenbot families separately this week and uh, just just point out what exactly baptism is it's to die to yourself it's nothing less than to to give up your life and say it's over for me i'm dead to the things that i was going to be and then to just like jesus rise up out of the water in baptism and rise up to a newness of life just like jesus has a newness of life and and it's it's both new both ways newness of life new, new life now you live not as yourself anymore, but as Christ to the world with his motives and his love and his power, not your motives and your loves and your power anymore. New life, resurrection, uh, but also a real bodily resurrection at the end. Baptism under the water, died with Jesus. Baptism out of the water. And you can, I can imagine Lydia coming up with probably purple clothes or something and a huge big smile on her face. Uh, she just grabbed hold of it for herself and for her household. And then in the next line, she's going to say, uh, I'm a believer in the Lord. That's how she describes herself now, a believer in the Lord, a truster of Jesus. Okay, but what I really want to point out to you this evening and lay on your heart is what an open heart does. The Lord's opened her heart to Jesus and then she opens up her house. It's so cool. Listen, in verse 15, it says, uh, she was baptized in her whole household and she invited us to her home. That's the first way he says it. And then he says it again. He quotes it. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. 
And then he says it a third time. And she persuaded us. I reckon she was so, so stoked that he's kind of noting three different ways, uh, uh, coming at it in three different ways, that she's brought us into her house. Um, um, and I'm guessing that there was a similar amount of cheese and red wine on the table as at Bilbo's and all the best, the deepest stocks of the house, like at Bilbo's, but with a different spirit, right? With hospitality, with let me get you more. I'm, and she, her heart had been opened and, and she just wanted to pour out um, her resources now for these people. But I want to show you here that Lydia doesn't just respond with with sharing her wealth and or, or you know it's just a house at this point once you see it happen a second time because in the, it's such a great read in the um in the very next part it says that uh paul goes out and <laughs> he's off doing his ministry he's often he's sharing the the gospel about jesus lord and savior and did you hear it says there's this slave girl who has a, a spirit and uh, she can tell the future, truthfully tell the future, and she makes a lot of money for her owners. That's a terrible thing to say, for her owners. Um, and when Paul turns up, she tells the truth some more. She sees spiritual things that other people can't see, and she starts saying, well, these guys, they can tell you how to get saved, but she just keeps on repeating it. The, the spirit that's in her can't say anything but the truth about, the, about Jesus when Paul's there. There's this crazy situation. And then it says, and Paul was so annoyed <laughs> by her saying, these guys will get saved if you come listen. Um, because she, it's just days of her just following and yelling it. Um, <laughs> that he, dry, he, he gives an exorcism and drives out that demon. And beautifully for her, she's free of the spirit, but terribly for her owners. Um, I say terribly, but it's a good thing. They can't make money off her anymore. And so Paul and his friends get thrown in prison for um, causing problems. It's this strange situation. They've just freed this poor girl and, um, and they get put in prison. Um, and uh, what happens? You, you, there's bits and pieces about being Roman citizens and stuff. And they finally get let out. And what do they do? They go to Lydia's because they know that her heart has been open to the Lord. And so her home is open to the Lord as well. But it's not that that's one after her baptism, two after prison for I'm guessing a wash and some food after prison, uh, just you know, pat on the back from Lydia. But but did you see who's at her house when they get there? It says the brothers and sisters were there already, and we encourage them. And so church tradition says that the church in Philippi met in Lydia's house because they're, they're there, the Christians are there in her house already. And I'm gonna um, share one more thing now from Philippians. The, the letter to the Philippians that confirms for me that uh, I think, yeah, the church must have met in Lydia's house. Because in the book of Philippians, written a number of years later by Paul, he writes to them and he says, I thank my God, this is chapter one, verse three, I thank my God every time I remember you, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. What I'm saying is that Lydia has had her heart open to the Lord and it she just deploys her wealth now. Uh, the first time, come have lunch after my baptism. The second time, come stay over after prison. Uh, but actually, there's Christians already in her home. And then he, he says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, um, from the first day until now, for years, you've been partnering us in the gospel. And the reason I chose this passage out for us as we look at Jesus and people who have a lot is because Jesus leads us to come to him and have a heart to him, and then to use our resources for his mission. He leads you to all sorts of things, but one of the things he leads you to is to use the wealth that he, he put in your pockets for his mission. He wants you to use the wealth on other things as well. I'll show you in just a moment some of the other things you ought to use your wealth on, and you're one of the things. But one of the things you ought to use your wealth on is his mission, to get the word of God. I, I'm so glad that some... Scout leaders got together in the 70s and made a scout camp where they could share the gospel. They gave up a week of their holidays every year for 40 years so that kids like me would come to Christ. Come to Christ. I'm so glad they did it. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give my life to serving. I've given my life to serving before working full-time at church and otherwise because I want other people to come to Christ as well. And I'll give my money to that too. And that's the pattern that we find in the New Testament that, that it's not just the ministers who do gospel work. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, you, Philippian church, have been partnering with me in the gospel. 
And uh, I remember when Sarah and I, <laughs> we first got married in second year of uni at Sydney Uni. And we both, she worked Woolies and uh, I worked on a hobby farm on Saturdays, uh, as well as our normal work in the, in the week at uni. And it was hard work and we kind of scraped by. Um, uh, someone, actually some Christian friends from that scout camp bought us a car once. They saw that our car was about to break. Uh, they referred to it as the rubber band was about to snap. I thought that was rude. But then they gave us one and a half thousand dollars and said, just get a new car. Come on, go. This is some of the generosity that I wasn't planning to tell you about. But um, Sarah and I were at uni scraping by, sometimes being helped with a, a one and a half grand for a car, because that's what we do for each other as Christians. Um, and uh, uh, I guess, and then we got to the end of the uni and suddenly Sarah got a whole teacher's salary. So much more money than a university student. And uh, I became an apprentice minister, and so I got the same amount as um, as a university student. Um, but we we suddenly had this huge salary to burn, right? It's so much fun when you get all this money, and and we did. We, we started to do some different things. We started to save for our own car so that we didn't need to get pulled out when the um, when the rubber band snaps. Uh, but one of the things we did, we said well, we were only giving a little bit. Like we were literally giving ten dollars a week to a friend um, so that they could do ministry at the the, the Christian group that had. Um, so blessed us at uni. We upped that. And I remember standing in the kitchen as we decided what amount we would give. And it was such an exciting thing to say, this is like, we're shouldering them now. We, we, this is not $10 a week anymore. We were part of, we were partners in that ministry at that point. We, we kind of were when it was $10, but we were real partners now. And this is one of the joys of following Jesus is being partners in getting the word of God out. And we live in Bondi. And so chances are, God has blessed you with a lot. And so I want to call you tonight, if you haven't noticed before, or refresh you if you have noticed, that we have some shouldering to do together of mission work. He, I, I, I'm speaking to Christian people here. He has put money in your pocket that's not for you. He's put some in there. He's put a heap in there that is for you, but he's put some in there that's for others, just doing good as you go. And he's put some in there for getting the word of God out to other people. That, I don't know why he does this, but... He, I find God to be a God who seems to work through people. He loves to invite people in. He could have just, just kind of unloaded a, a pot of gold on, on the missionaries, but he loves to draw people into partnership. So I want to lay this on you, that God opens our hearts to the Lord Jesus and then invites us into his mission work to bear, to shoulder some of the mission work. And I want you to see this as a joy. Uh, I do think this is here in this passage because you see it in Lydia at the, at the middle of chapter 16 and then at the end when they come out of prison. But you also see it between those things because there's the Philippian jailer uh, that, that Paul leads to Jesus and gets baptised as well. And it says his, his heart was filled with joy and he invited them to come and stay at his house and he, and he puts out dinner as well. So you see it with Lydia and then you see it with the Philippian jailer just a few lines later as well. Jesus opens your heart and then calls you into partnership. Now, um, as I wrote this, I thought this is pretty stark actually, uh, but I do believe it's what the, what the Bible teaches, but it's pretty stark and a number of questions came to my mind and I wanna just answer a few of them with you now. Uh, first of all, is it really true that if you're a Christian, you ought to be giving away some of your money? Yes, it's really true. Uh, it's the shape of, of all, not just our money, but it's the shape of all the things that we're doing. Uh, listen, to Mark, listen to Jesus in Mark chapter 8. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Jesus says, if you want to follow him, it's a life of saying no to yourself. Just tomorrow, if you're following Jesus, there will be times when you say no to yourself. Whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. That means to die. So tomorrow, if you're following Jesus, if, uh, and, yeah, if you're someone who follows Jesus tomorrow, you will die a number of times to yourself. Over the next uh, decade, you will need to lay down your life a number of times and it will feel like dying, says Jesus. That's what it is to follow me. And this is in all things, not just money, but including our money. You will sometimes, as you follow Jesus, give your money away in a way that feels like dying because you won't get to do other stuff because you gave it to, to Paul so that he could go for another extra six months around that way. Uh, so yes, uh, first of all, my first question was, does it really, is it, 
we really want to be giving sacrificial emission? Yes, that's the first one. Second question. Uh, <clears throat> what if I'm sitting here right now and I don't want to give my money away? Well, I really want to encourage you to slow down and take another look at the Lord Jesus and the shape of things. Because the Bible says, Paul particularly in 2 Corinthians says, God loves a cheerful giver. I, I just really want to say, if you don't want to give your money away tonight uh, or, or going forward in the future, then don't. Because you haven't done the, you haven't kind of met the Jesus that Lydia meets and that the Philippian jailer meets. This giving comes from overflowing joy. And so I want to say, don't give your money away if you don't want to. Uh, engage with Jesus and, and see him for who he is first. Uh, thirdly, third question, what about me? That was my third question. What about me? Uh, can I ever have nice stuff? And the answer is yes. Because uh, in the New Testament, in 1, 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, Paul says that God has provided richly. Let me, let me actually read it. Chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verse 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. The first thing he says is, if you're, if you're rich, he doesn't say, give it all away and never have anything for yourself. That's not what he says. He says, command those who are rich not to be arrogant and not to put their hope in one. That doesn't mean don't have it. He says, don't put your hope in it though, because it's uncertain. Instead, put your hope in God, he says. <clears throat> and this changed, my, this changed my walk with Jesus. Ready? This next line. God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God has put money in your pocket for your enjoyment. When I first started engaging with mission and I'm a giver now, I can do more than $10 a week uh, to my friend at Sydney Uni. Um, uh, I thought, I guess this means I can never have ice cream again because I really want the, the, the gospel to go out. And I thought I had to never have anything nice so that I could give as much. And I've got a friend who's done this for a number of years, mainly just lives off rice and has holes in his um, sneakers and eats eggs sometimes because he's, he's just living on that line so that he can give everything away. And you might be called like he is to do that. But this verse says, God puts money in your pocket for your enjoyment. And some of you need to hear tonight that your money is not all for you. Uh, you uh, yeah, depending on what you're like. And some of you need to hear that some of it has been given to you by God for your enjoyment because he's a father. And I don't know which side of the donkey you fall off. Um, for me, it was, um, am, I, am I allowed to enjoy things guilt-free? 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, he's richly provided for your enjoyment. Um, yes. So uh, that answers that question. You are allowed to, but it's just, a, it's about balance, isn't it? It's about knowing yourself. And it's, it's, a, it's about sitting down probably most Januaries and thinking, all right, who am I going to support? Which people? Uh, which missionaries, which agencies, uh, how much am I going to give to church, um, and uh, what, what kind of good things am I going to enjoy this year because God has recently provided me with everything for my enjoy, enjoyment. That's what it says in my TV. Okay, uh, another question that came to my mind was, I trust Jesus with my money, but not necessarily the church. And I think that's a really good question um, uh, to ask and to wonder about. Uh, do we just kind of, you know, throw it in the door and hope for the best? No, um, I think there's a, a pattern set in the New Testament of being very careful with money and being scrupulous. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul talks about taking a collection. He says in chapter 16, now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So there's a principle there actually um, about, uh, what do you call that kind of, the idea of tithing rather than just everybody has to give $600 today. It's no, no keeping with the income. If you're, if you're a uni student, it might only be $10 a week. Uh, if you earn more, then it's probably going to be more. So he says, on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections have to be made. Then, then he says in verse three, uh, then when I arrive, I'll give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. And, and what he's saying there, he says, I said, there'll be some people that we approve of and we'll have letters that say that they're trustworthy with the money. And it's, it's forming a pattern or a, um, yeah, a pattern of being careful with church money. When we, when we put money together, we don't just, um, you know, it's been given to Jesus. Let's uh, we'll just uh, put it in the minister's house for a couple of weeks or something like that. Or, or you know, it's, it's not careless with people's money. We've got to be very careful. 
And I really appreciate at our church that um, there's a policy of two people always count the money in the box. Um, it gets banked and checked, double checked, where the ministers, uh, paid ministers are not supposed to touch it at all. Shouldn't cross our hands. Um, what else? Uh, we're audited independently once a year. I, I just think all these things are really important and fit with the pattern that if you're going to take people's money or you know, um, be given people's money for gospel work, it ought to all get there. And I, I believe that's what you start to see in 1 Corinthians 16. So, uh, okay. And then what should you give to? Give to gospel work. Um, um, be, be a generous person just as you go in your day. But there's, um, there's gospel work to do and we ought to be funding it, shouldering it together. Um, and so look to what Jesus speaks about and find organizations that do that, that are forwarding the kingdom of God. Uh, and it happens in different ways. And you might have a particular connection with uh, one part of the world or with, um, you know, maybe compassion that um, is releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Um, or you might have friends like I do at Sydney Uni who are just doing heaps of gospel work, training young people to go out full up of the gospel, uh, but find someone who is doing the work of the kingdom under Jesus and fund them. Uh, there, there are people all over the place. I come and please come and have coffee with me if you don't know what to give to and you think, no, I've got to start doing this because this is the kind of thing you put off for a couple of years. Isn't it? But you ought to have come, come and have coffee with me this week and I'll tell you about people who are low on funds for different ministries. I, I, I do want to just without embarrassment in invite you to make sure that you're giving regularly to our church if you're a member here so that we can do stuff in Bondi and we can we can roll the word of God out like you see in Acts uh, but then also go further afield all sorts of good organizations that I'd love to tell you about I have one friend that just found a connection in Nairobi flew over there and started talking to the ministers there and uh, what did they need they needed buildings for young ministers apprentices to sleep in and so he just goes over once a year and checks and then sends checks um, throughout the year uh, he's a doctor so earns reasonably but he also doesn't like sleeping very much it's a bit strange and so he just does night shifts and he uses the day shifts money for life and enjoyment uh he was one of the guys that gave us money for car and the night shifts he uses for nairobi to just just fund that that thing and make it happen very cool um and it's, it's just he's grown a network of churches just by bankrolling it and checking it checks every year uh, and I just want to call you to that ministry of giving tonight and make sure you know that that is uh, one of, one of the, the joys that God gives us. And it is a joy because remember Jesus says, <laughs> um, where your treasure is, your heart will be. But before that, he says, oh, you can't serve two masters. You, you'll only have one. Either you'll, you'll love one and hate the other. You can't serve God and money. And in this ministry of, of giving, we kind of uh, just remind ourselves that I don't, I don't need this actually. It's not my master. Because money will get you to die for it. it. That's what it does to people. It calls you to come and die for it. Come and work hard and one way or the other die for it. But Jesus is the master who lays down his life for you and will keep providing. And giving is a, it's a ministry to other people, but it's a ministry to yourself as well, actually. There's joy in it and there's uh, freedom and licensing as you do it. I know one person that comes to our church that when they move to Bondi, they put on a piece of paper the different uh, rentals that, and, and the pros and cons and they went for one of the cheaper ones just so they had a bigger margin to give towards church. I was just gobsmacked by that. They just, they love bank rolling church. And that's, um, that's, that's the gospel overflowing. That's, that's not a Bilbo Baggins. That's not a give us your money. That's a Jesus is at work in that person. Okay, uh, I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing.